But I right. think there's so much opportunity when you do present your undivided self to God. Welcome to the Ryan Holmes podcast, where our goal is to encourage Christian thinking and Christian living. This week, we are bringing you episode number 11, and it's a bit different, you'll notice. We are bringing you our second interview of the podcast, and I'm very excited about today's guest. Um, he is a squad leader for adventures and missions, and he has been on the mission field um, for the past number of years uh, with the world race. His name is Connor Gall. Connor, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. Thanks, Ryan. It's good to be here. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. So as we get into it, um, I know many people may know who you are, but uh, for those who don't know, can you just kind of give us a bit of a background, um, where you're from, and how you came to faith? Yeah, I, I'm sure that there's plenty of people out there who do know who I am, since my name is so widespread. I'm, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for, for the for the other seven billion people in the world who don't actually know who I am. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, my name's Connor, I'm 28 years old now, which is wild. I realized that I had my, like, I, it's been 10 years since I graduated high school. So I'm kind of like feeling yeah. young and, 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 and feeling still really good. But then I look at my, my age and I'm like, wow, like, it's, it's got some experience now. I, I grew up in uh, Lake Trobe, Pennsylvania. It's like an hour or, or just over an hour outside of Pittsburgh um, in a little small town and um, it was a great place to grow up. I, I grew up um, in the independent Baptist church, um, similar to, uh, to you, Ryan. And um, yeah, I was just kind of like a church kid of my entire life. I, I fell in love with the idea of missions when I was like 12 years old, um, uh, 12 or 13 years old, which is around the same time that I actually like professed my faith in Christ. I made a profession as a four-year-old that I don't remember. And when I was 12, the the idea of like, man, what if that didn't count? You know, like the fact that I mm -hmm. couldn't bring it back to my memory. So I told my parents about it. And I remember at 12, I like trusted Christ officially. So covered my bases there, <laughs> so to speak. And, um, uh, and then, yeah, when I was 13 or very shortly after I was, I was saved, I just started really resonating with missionaries that would come through um, the church. And I was like, man, I would love to, I would love to do that one day. But I think it was until like I was 16 that I like got baptized again. Like I had been baptized when I was eight years old, was very like, a, like very much a people pleaser growing up. So I kind of started taking my faith more seriously, I think around like age 16 when I was like, okay, I actually do want to serve God with my life. I actually do like want to identify with him and because that's more important than what people think. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, and then I, I headed off to Bible college. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's... Um... For those who don't know, that's where Connor and I met. And um, yeah, it's uh, what what year did you graduate? Twenty fourteen. I graduated twenty fifteen. When twenty fifteen. I was trying to okay. think because you were you were a year ahead of me, or were you two years ahead of me? Um. Well, I had when I went there. I went for when I first went there. I think it was two thousand nine. I was there for a semester. Then I left. Um, was gone for a year, and then I went back. So. I guess technically it was just a, when we were actually there, I guess I was a year ahead of you. Um, but yeah. um, if I would have stayed, it would have been two years, but yeah, I had Dang. that kind of brief hiatus um, in between my first and second semester. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Which I didn't know. I don't think I, I listened to your, uh, the, the episode with Nate Stone and, uh, and I learned that fact and I was like, Oh dang, I didn't know that you took a year break in between. That's uh that's pretty cool. Yeah, it wasn't for good reasons, but uh, <laughs> God brought me back. So Fair enough. Um, thankful for that. But yeah, which also yeah, speaking we, of Nate, I realized that I am your first American interview. That's true. I which, hadn't um, thought of that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm glad to, to have a fun fact here on the podcast. There you go. I mean, half the audience is from the States, so we got to make them happy somehow, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so we met at uh, Bible College and um, we never really had like a, 
I guess we never hung out like a ton. Like we were good, we were friends. Um, we yeah. never really hung out a ton. Uh, I wish we would have, it would have been awesome. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So what, I guess, I guess, was it missions that brought you to, to Bible college? And that I guess was kind of the driving factor behind it. Yeah. Once I, so I went to Haiti, uh, for my first mission trip for like a, a week. Um, my mom invited me, she was doing like a medical thing with, uh, some yeah. like, uh, friends of hers. And I was 16. I was the youngest person in the group. I think the next oldest was in their forties. And so I kind of just, I don't know, helped, uh, pass out some medicine and some accounts and different pills and stuff for, um, people that we were serving in Haiti while also like playing with the kids and playing soccer and, and handing out food and going with our hosts, different places. And I just fell in love with the whole, um, concept of missions. I remembered like having that heart for it when I was a kid, when I was 12. And um, so then I was like, okay, if I'm going to do, if I'm going to do this with my life, I need to obviously go to Bible college in the, in the youth group in the church I grew up with. There was a very heavy push for serving God with your life. And um, it kind of all worked out for me. I'm like, okay, I, I want to do this anyways. It'll please my pastor, my youth pastor. Um, and then I can make a choice that is something that I believe is also pleasing God and it'll help me get trained to do this thing. Um, as I continued like studying at West coast, um, at our Bible college, I think I eventually ended up with like a dual degree, like pastoral theology and missions. Um, since I think a lot of the, the good things that I brought out of Bible college were like actual like Bible study and Bible classes versus like, right. We weren't really doing a ton of practical missions, classes. Mm -hmm. We were kind of studying like the history of missions, but um, I think I, I actually gained a lot more from like the actual, you know, studying through um, Old Testament, New Testament uh, theology and doctrine mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so going kind of beyond Bible college, what would, what did that look for you? Obviously, obviously you eventually got to the mission field, but uh, what kind of did those few years look like for you uh, leading into that that time on the mission field yeah I, bible college i think for me bro it was like it was simple you know like i mm -hmm. my identity was solid i was the bible college student you know um there wasn't like a lot of real life stressors that were hitting me at the time and so i really enjoyed those four years i um you know was i became like a dorm supervisor which i think I was trying to remember if you were ever in my dorm. I don't think Which you were. Which dorm were you the supervisor of? Lawrence Hall. <laughs> no, I, no, I don't think I was when you were, were leading it. I think I would have been. So what year was that? Were you, did you do it for a couple of years? I was like 2013 to 2014, then 2014 to 2015, which you would have been gone 14 to 15. Yeah, 2014, I was in the, the small dorm founders. Um, yeah. I don't remember 2013. So, which is why I think we never really got super close because I was all, I was focused on like getting to know the guys in mm -hmm. my dorm, and then you have your like little friend groups. Also, I don't know if your listeners know this, but uh, you're a great basketball player, and so you were also <laughs> like on the basketball team and with the cool kids, so to speak. I was like <laughs> I was like the cool kid because I was like a preacher boy, so it was kind of like a like separate separate uh, ways that our paths did cross, but never in a way that we like hung out a ton, but uh, right. I'm glad we're hanging yeah. out now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And people like people have told me that before. And like, and I, I always think, well, there's, there's, there's people and like, there was friend groups that I wish I could have been a part of. And like, you're one of the friends that I wish I could have hung out with more. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, but I guess it just never worked out, never in the same dorm. And yeah, I, mean, we're, we we're, I guess, I guess we we're good friends, but not really we didn't spend a ton of time together but yeah a lot of shared experiences and things to relate to um as we yeah. look back um but i agree I, I was like man this is a guy that i should have got to know got to know better and i think it's just the funny part about having a small bible college it's still big enough to where you don't get to know everybody like right. extremely well but um i was for sure addicted to like popularity in that time of my life um right. i i took pride in the fact that i could relate with the students pretty well. And I, I could also like really, I like had the, the good graces of the faculty and the staff. And so oh, right. yeah. um, I didn't see myself as somebody who was operating off of the currency of other people's approval, um, but I was good at it. Mm -hmm. And so 
it was, it was an easy time of life for me. Like I for sure could have done better in my studies, but I kind of was able to, you know, give like 80% effort and then also <laughs> have a good social life. And so, yeah. um, I, I ended up being the class president for my senior class, which is not based off of the valedictorian system. It's basically a popularity oh, really? contest. Oh, I didn't know <laughs> that. Yeah, they kind of, you just kind of like vote for who you want to represent you and people voted for me. And so I, I graduated on, honestly with an ego. Like I, I wanted to serve God and that there was a very genuine part of my life that, you know, wanted to please the Lord. Um, but I got, I got sucked into um, my identity being like my affirmation from, from school. And so when I, when I graduated, my thought was to go, um, I was dating somebody at the time. I wanted to be a missionary to India, wanted to reach like the 1040 window. And mm -hmm. I had a pastor who was very well known in the Bible college space that I was going to be working for. So I just had my checklist, like everything was going my way until it didn't, you know? Right. And yeah. I, I got to, I went to India for three weeks and I was very humbled by that experience. I started to question like, is this the place that I really could live for my life? And, and, and is this the people group that God is calling me to? Um, I eventually broke up with my girlfriend and which was a, which was a good relationship, but it just, you know, wasn't, um, something that I was ready to step into as far as like a marriage commitment. And then eventually I ended up, um, leaving the church I was working for because our pastor left at the time. And I really wasn't sure if there was going to be a position for me. So I just decided to go and, um, try and seek more education um, through a master's degree, but mostly just because I didn't know what else to do. I, I placed a lot of stock in that pastor kind of um, giving me a lot of opportunities. And so once he left, I think my world kind of like crumbled. And I realized that I didn't really have a ton built on God himself. I had God as like a, a building block in my life, but not as the foundation. And um, so I really started like questioning a lot of things. And the biggest question was like, what is my purpose? What am I meant to do now that my plans have kind of fallen apart? And so that, that like brought me into um, the world race, which is the organization that I've been able to travel with for the past couple of years doing missions work, um, which has been like a pretty incredible experience. Right. Okay. So, so let's give us, give our audience an idea of like what the world race um was all about and like, and what were you, what you were doing, your travels and whatnot, if you could kind of give a brief description of, of your experience there. Yeah. The world race is, um, is a program out of, um, the organization called adventures and missions. And, um, it's basically a way to like bring in the, the millennials or like the youth who like want to travel, who want to take a gap year. Now, of course it's Gen Z. Um, but really like the millennial push I think was like, going in and traveling and backpacking Europe was like a sexy idea to do. And so they're like, Hey, let's give people a chance where they can, they can go on this journey while like bringing and building the kingdom of God. Um, so what it is, is it's a 11 month mission trip that goes to 11 different countries. Um, and we have different host connections in all of those countries. So um, as you start your journey, you'll spend like one month with a host in, for me, it was in Colombia. Um, and then you'll go to the next country, you'll spend time with that host. And so as you go the 11 months, you have like a variety of ministry experiences. Sometimes you're working with churches, other times you're helping someone build a house or you're working in an orphanage or you're, you know, doing community projects. And so it really gives people the chance to not only travel, uh, uh, but also have like a lot of variety in their missions, ministry experience. Honestly, while like discipling after Jesus, leaving your comforts from the U S the entire time. And so right. the bigger, the bigger idea about it is like, it's an awakening journey. Like when the Jesus called his disciples to follow him, he was like, okay, leave your occupation and come disciple after me. And so being able to leave what's familiar and going into something that's unfamiliar, unfamiliar following Jesus um, brings a lot of like really cool fruit and transformation in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And it did so, it did so for me. And so um, it's cool to like have gone through that myself and feel like I've gone deeper into my relationship with Christ, especially since Bible college, it was a lot more based on me. And then this phase of my life is a lot more based on him, thankfully. Right. Okay. 
That's awesome. So how many years were you um, then doing the world race and on uh, and actively on the mission field? Yeah, I started in 2018, October 2018 was when I when I left the US. And then I got back in August of 2019. I was home for 12 days before I went back out for another seven months. Um, whenever I was in Thailand, whenever like COVID was really um, affecting travel. And mm -hmm. so they pulled us off the field. They pulled like over 500 missionaries off the field at the time, which is, which is oh, crazy. Right. Um, yeah. And so from March, 2020 up until the end of the year, I was home kind of like, again, questioning is missions what I'm supposed to do. I still thought like I had some more to give with this organization. So I um, have spent the last couple of months, January, 2021 to June, 2021 um, traveling again. So total, I've, I've lived overseas for 20, well, for two years, 24 months, um, but it's been kind of like a three-year portion of my life. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what, could you give us kind of a breakdown? I know, obviously, you mentioned a bunch of different things, and there were, it seems like you guys are really hitting a variety of different things, but could you give us an idea of like what a daily routine would be um, <laughs> yeah. actively on, on, on the mission field? Yeah, man, I, I think that's one of the hardest things being back yeah. is trying to paint a picture for people. It's like, I, I wish I could just like, you know, have people jump into my brain and experience it. Cause it's, <laughs> it is so unique, you know, like, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's a lot of things that are similar. It just all depends on where you are. Um, right. Like um, in Peru and Honduras, for instance, I was living out of a tent. And so my routine living out of tents is different than my routine, like living in an Airbnb in Armenia. Right. But um, typically like crazy. The, the, the ebb and flow of the world race is you get to a country, you meet your host and they kind of like will outline um, what your experience that month is going to be. And so sometimes you'll do ministry in the morning. Sometimes you'll do it later at night. My preferred kind of like daily flow would be to have time in the morning to um, have my quiet time and really like invest in my time with God. Cause I'm traveling with, you know, sometimes 40 other people. Um, and so you're with, you're within teams the entire time. So you're kind of constantly living in community. And so quiet alone time is like really valuable. Um, and then, you know, as, as that dies down, maybe you start like ministry um, throughout the day and hopefully it involves like street food and being able to experience some of the, the cool food culture um, within um, whatever country typically we're on foot a lot. So we're getting to like walk through little towns and experience like building relationships with the person who sells pastries or, um, the person who sells coffee and, um, as well as building relationships with our host family and, um, whoever we're ministering to, whether that be like, mm. you know, children or women at risk or, or what have you. Um, and then, yeah, then we'll kind of have team time at the end of the day where we kind of invest in, you know, your specific team. Um, because one of the other aspects of the race is like building community. Like you guys are, we're like a mobile church. So how can we, um, get to know one another, strengthen each other. Um, and it's been really cool to, um, learn from so many other perspectives, um, when it comes to faith denomination or, or what, whatever. Okay. That's uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, for, for anybody who might kind of want more information on that. Um, maybe we'll link to in the description below, we'll link to that so you can be able to share that with others as well. Um, yeah, that'd and, be awesome. Uh, if they can, if they want to find out more information. So yeah, we'll be sure to, to link to that. To, um, yeah. If, if people want to, are interested in it or, or anything like that. If living out of a backpack for a year is, is up your alley, go, go check this thing out. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm not sure I could do it. It's not a vacation. I'll throw that out there as well. It's, uh, it's cool to, to have like travel experience, but there's also, it, we're living on a limited budget and, it, and it, mm -hmm. it does, it challenges your, like the abandonment aspect. And, and so it's a good opportunity. It's not necessarily for everyone. Right. Yeah. No. And I yeah. like that idea of, you're having to sacrifice something for the gospel and for, for the kingdom's sake. And um, yeah, I mean, that's what God calls us to. So it's, it seems like a really cool experience. Yeah. Yeah. So where are you now then? Um, you've transitioned out of that. Uh, so what are you, what are you up to at this point? Yeah. So I, I had this like just urge to travel and to, 
and that was hard for me to like settle for a while. Um, this past year, I think probably like February, um, 2021, I was, uh, you know, in, I think Costa Rica. And I was like looking at still having to go another five, four or five months of being away. And I was like, man, I just want to be, I'd rather be like home. I'd rather be like somewhere that I can call home and be settled and established. So I'm in a phase of my life now where I'm thankful that I had, you know, I've, I've been to 18 countries in three years and that's like, yeah, that's that's wild. Um, And I'm really proud of that. But I'm, I'm also like really thankful that I've come to a place where I'm ready to like, commit to a place and a job for um, the, the next foreseeable couple of years. Um, so I'm currently living in Gainesville, Georgia, which is where the headquarters for Adventures and Missions is. I got hired on as what is called a squad mentor um, for the program, the World Race, um, which basically is kind of like a stateside quarterback, um, or maybe a better term is like a coach who stands on the sidelines. Yeah. I'll have groups of people, we call them squads, um, Mm -hmm. come into the ministry, we'll train them, we'll um, go through a bunch of different biblical teachings and practical teachings, and then we'll, we'll send them out to the nations. And Mm -hmm. I'll stay, I'll stay home, um, helping them uh, logistically, and also have a chance to guide them spiritually. Uh, My responsibility is kind of like cast vision, set culture, be available for emergencies, um, and kind of direct them as they go out and do the thing. Um, and then from time to time, like four to five times a year, I'll be able to travel out to visit them to do what we call our, our debriefs, which is just kind of like asking them how their experience has been, um, be there to support and encourage them. So just being like a mentor figure in their lives as they are on their own missionary journey. So I feel really blessed to be active in the transformation that other people go through because it's something that I, that really helped me and that I believe in. Um, and then to, to kind of go from being the missionary to investing in groups of other young missionaries, it's just like a cool, I think, transition um, when it comes to influencing the lives of others and making sure that we do missions in an honorable way. You know, there's a lot of, right. there's a lot of different discussion in the mission world of like, what is, you know, it's not always the greatest look when just a bunch of white people show up taking pictures with whoever, right? So it's like, how right. can we still share the gospel around the world while also doing it in a way that pleases Christ and that honors the cultures? And that's something that I'm excited to like teach people how to do because I feel pretty passionate about it. That's exciting. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. So you'll be, you'll be basically starting that this fall, correct? Yeah. So my first squad will come to training in October and then they'll launch out in January. Awesome. That's really exciting. Yeah. It's getting close. Oh, yeah, it's getting there, eh? <laughs> so I wanted to um, kind of head into the kind of the overarching topic and idea for our discussion. Um, and I think it's very connected to the work you're doing. So uh, it's good for people to get that context of kind of where, where you came from and what you've been doing. But um, we've, we've entitled this uh, episode, The Gift of Singleness. Um, and I think... I think it's a, a good a good discussion. I know Connor is passionate about this this topic as well. Um, so I just kind of want to frame the discussion as we um, get into it and get Connor's thoughts on it. But um, the reason why I wanted to bring Connor in and talk to him about this subject is because I feel like within, especially within Christian circles, um, singleness can often be seen as a negative thing, um, almost as almost a kind of quasi purgatory where you're essentially just (laughs) you're you're waiting for god's will for your life you're waiting for the next step you're waiting for a husband a wife to really get into what your life is all about and whatnot and um i think connor is a great example of somebody who has um has stepped out and has chosen to to focus on just pursuing god's will for his life and and reaching people and making an impact um and putting that kind of in the forefront of his mind. And so I just want to kind of bring an encouraging discussion around the topic of singleness um, and help people understand that you can embrace it. Uh, And also just because you're embracing your singleness doesn't mean that you're subjecting yourself to a lifetime of singleness. Um, uh, And so I hope that, and Connor is going to be better in, in this discussion because 
I know people are going to be like, Ryan, you're married. How can you talk about this? Well, that's why I have Connor here. All right. So, um, <laughs> and I was, I was single at one point. So, um, but uh, yeah, Connor. So I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts into this um, uh, on this subject and um, starting even if we could start at kind of Bible college. And the reason why I want to start there is because oftentimes it's not necessarily taught but what's caught in the Bible college setting is, and I can be, I was guilty of this where if somebody doesn't get married, you're almost like, Oh man, they are, I feel really bad for them. You know? Yeah. Too bad. And, yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like you missed out on the Bible college experience by not finding yeah. a spouse and you get this in your mind where it's like, they have to live a lifetime of singleness. Now when it's like looking back on it, it's the stupidest thing I've, I've ever thought in my life, but <laughs> um, I don't know but if you've real. experienced Right. I don't know if you've experienced this as well. Um, uh, from the Bible college setting, maybe you can share your thoughts on that. Yeah. And I'm excited to have this discussion with Ryan because I think it's like a ball of yarn that a bunch will come unraveled as we start tugging on the string. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, we had discussed a little bit um, before recording, like what the topic was going to be. And so I've spent some time like thinking like what, what actually did happen? What did I pick up? So like subconsciously, and I know that our experiences will probably even be similar or different, um, similar in, in cases, but different based on our upbringing. Like, I think mm -hmm. I was really just teed up my entire life to be weird about dating relationships, like growing up with the six inch rule and it really not being something in my small Christian school that people did like dating just wasn't really a thing. You'd go to youth conferences and you'd like maybe friend someone on Facebook afterwards once that became a thing. But um, for me, I just never dated. So I got to Bible college, like having a very, I think kind of like nervous and elevated view of, of dating, of relationships. Um, and then once you get to Bible college, the specific one that we went to, at least it was, um, a lot of focus was, was placed on it. And so mm -hmm. for, for me, it just translated into pressure. Like there was this expectation to do what everybody else was doing. Um, there was this expectation that you would be married. Like after you graduate Bible college, it was kind of like the four years there, you meet somebody, you get married after, and then you go into ministry. That's like mm -hmm. the natural progression of things. Right. And so, um, I, I picked up a bunch of negative things that affected my thinking, but I didn't, I didn't know it. I kind of just, what I knew was that I was nervous. I was like, I was scared. And at the end of the day, I just didn't want to like be single for much longer because singleness like equal to second best. And right. I think that's probably something that a lot of people who, who are single, like listening to this, who come from church structures um, or church backgrounds is like, oh yeah, marriage is number one singleness is like maybe even number like three it's like we don't even like we just <laughs> right think it's so much um yeah it's it's we devalue the idea of singleness unfortunately um mm -hmm. and it almost like puts marriage on this weird pedestal that can easily become i think like idolatry um not to like make it too intense but we can obsess over it and and miss out a lot of great things for being single so i don't know were, were, did you pick up like similar notions from bible college or were you was your view a little different I think um, now my background's a bit different because I, I didn't necessarily grow up in the independent Baptist circles. And um, I grew up in a few different churches because my parents were searching for a good church. They kind of church hopped a lot of my upbringing and whatnot. And I got into some bad things in high school, um, public school and um, all the things that came along with that. Uh, so my view of dating and whatnot um, uh, was I would say tainted in a sense when I got to Bible college, and, which had to be kind um, of wild to compare it to like the Bible college version of, of dating. It it like it kind of freaked me out at the beginning when I first <laughs> got there. Um, yeah. yeah, so it was just it was just it was just a total transformation of um, going from a public school setting to where like you could even have girls that are friends, right? So I was very friendly with. Uh, just having conversation with girls and stuff like that. And in the Bible college setting, it's like Ryan now wants to marry me because I had a conversation with them. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. that was the, ex that was the extreme I was going from. <laughs> yeah. But, but by, by the end of Bible college, um, obviously you kind of get into that culture and whatnot um, to where it's like, it's so, it's, 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 it's so talked about where it's like, it's like find a wife, 
um, graduate college, go into ministry. Like that is the, like you said, the progression, right? Um, and so that, that's kind of the, the, the perspective I developed and, you know, by God's grace, thankfully I, I found, um, my wife there. Um, but yeah, like I, I could get this sense where it's like, if somebody, um, didn't find that, that, that spouse at Bible college, you get a sense of like, oh man, that I feel really bad for them. You know what I mean? But yeah, looking back, it's like, you're still super young. You, you have your life to live. Like it's yeah. not, it's not the end. Like why, why would you think this way? But that's what was kind of caught for me personally um, to where I'd just be like, man, I wish they found somebody or, or, or whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I could even understand that the negative view towards singleness um almost like you you can't really serve god until you find that spouse you know what i mean yeah and that's it's funny you say that man because that's where it affected me the the most the, the heaviest you know was i just had this idea and i think it was low-key vocalized multiple times um not that the intention was to like shame anybody it's kind of like there's a lot of energy and drama and giddiness when it comes to who's dating who and like, Oh, yeah. let's, let's go with this person. And that's like, when you have people who are teaching at Bible college, you've been married for, you know, 20 plus years, 30 plus years. It's like, how can you not want to play matchmaker a little bit? Like, right. sure, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm sure that's, and that's in everybody to an extent in our culture for sure. Yeah. Um, but then you kind of started like understanding that like, Oh, those people who had a wife or a husband, they're more likely to get hired into this position at the church mm, right. um, because like, God forbid we hire a single youth pastor. He's probably just going to have all these scandals with all of these teenage girls. Right. Like you can, the same thing can happen and has happened with unfortunately people who are married too. But mm -hmm. yeah. I for sure got it in my mind that it's like, if I want a legitimate job at a church, um, that's not just like a Christian school teacher. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a, I've got to get married. If I'm going to be an assistant pastor, a, a pastor one day, like a youth pastor, like this is a requirement. And so, you know, that environment plus my upbringing already, I was honestly viewing myself as like one half of an incompleted whole. Um, right. So I, I was incomplete as a human being until I find my wife. Um, and I, it wasn't until I, was traveling with um, the, the trip that I've been on that I, un, that I like got to that lie that existed in my heart. I, I had never really thought of it as like Jesus completes me, that in Christ mm -hmm. I am complete. Like I think I maybe knew it in my brain, but I, right. didn't, I didn't grab hold to it like in, a, in an inner truth. Um, and I remember I was on, I was literally, it's like kind of a dramatic story. I was on a beach in India so it's kind of interesting. I came back to the place that I had went to after Bible college and in a country where you're, they're supposed to be just nothing but people. I was on this like fisherman's beach where there really was nobody. Um, we were mm -hmm. teaching English at this little school, um, not far away from the beach. And so I was walking the beach one day and I just realized like, man, I, I view myself as incomplete. I don't see Christ as somebody who completes me. I need a wife to complete me. And when I kind of like sh shine the light on that, that lie, that false belief, um, I could just like breathe easy and um, really take a lot more ownership in, in my singleness. And it opened up a lot of things with my relationship with Jesus as well. That's awesome. Would you say that um, there's a potential that um, you could miss out on what God has for you at that life stage with, with that mindset? Like, did you notice a change and a major shift when you kind of came to that realization with like your impact now in the stage that you're at. Um, yeah. Did you, did you kind of experience that at all? Yeah. I think there's a bit of like, there was something in me that knew that I had to start making decisions um, at some point. Like I could, mm -hmm. you know, wait and put myself in a position where I could get um, married for a while or, I'm just going to have to start like taking some ownership in my, in my life right. and um, actually stepping into missions as a single guy was, a, was a risk for me because it went against this thing that I was taught, this thing that I ended up believing. And so to find a, to find a program, and I think that's what's great about the world race in, in one sense is 
there's a lot of great things. But um, for me, it was like, here's a bunch of other single people who are wanting to like go and serve the Lord, abandoning like whatever it takes in order to reach the nations. And so I could have a community of people who are in a similar life stage as me, um, as opposed to like being in a church environment where I feel disqualified or I feel, you know, not good enough um, to, to serve in the same capacity as somebody who's married. Um, and I think that's a bummer, man. Like, I don't think, you know, I think that there, there's a lot that could be said for like the way that the church views singleness and single people. Um, we're already experiencing a way of life that is like uh, isolating with the things we face with COVID and like with, you know, do you believe this? Do you believe that? Are you in this camp or this like form of belief? And I think yeah. like there is a bit of the feeling like you're either in the married club or you're in the single club. And like whether you're 22 or, you know, 28 or like 30 or like in your 50s, like um, I think there is a, a loneliness factor and a um, we're different than until we get married. That's just a really tough thing to, to fight against. Um, but once I started like taking some more ownership um, and I, I kind of like the Lord transformed my thinking a little bit. Um, I started to see the amazing opportunities that I actually have not having a wife, not having, you know, kids to be able to go and do something that would be pretty hard for, for people to do if they have like a wife or, or young children. Like there are some people who um, go on this trip um, married, but the majority are single. And so I look back on the amount of things I've been able to do these past couple of years and just really praise the Lord for, the, uh, the opportunity I had to do it with like what you said, the gift for me, the gift of singleness um, came in like the opportunity for um, just really focused mission, life on mission with, with Christ in the capacity of international, you know, service and volunteer work. Right. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So you, you would say that you probably wouldn't have had this opportunity and experience that you did if you would have, succumb to the pressures of getting married and just get married um for the sake yeah. of getting married and feeling that pressure you probably wouldn't have had these experiences and the time on the mission field that you did have would you say that's yeah. correct yeah yeah 100 percent. it's been you know like i i'm i also want to be transparent for this podcast and say that like i still catch myself obs obsessing over marriage like i i'm i'm 28 years old and probably my, my back and forth struggle daily is like trying not to, to blame God for still being single, but being thankful for where I am. So like, even though I've been able to experience some incredible things, I still wrestle with that gratitude or that mm -hmm. line of thinking, which I think a lot of people can probably relate with. Um, but yeah, as I look back and I think about the, the relationship I had in, in in Bible college and how little I knew and how like really I wasn't ready. Um, I'm so glad that I didn't just propose because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, that I actually took time to like understand who I am as a person, where my strengths are, where my weaknesses are, what I actually mm -hmm. believe. Um, and, and that led me to saying, okay, something I really value is the, the chance to travel and to, to share the gospel with people around the world. Um, kind of like, actually saying that what I value as Connor is, is worth it and is valuable. And what he is like placed on my heart to do um, is valuable. And the, the dream he's given me can actually really be harnessed to its maybe fullest capacity as a single man. Um, and so as I look back on the past couple of years, it's like, man, I wouldn't trade it um, for, I'm sure marriage is great, will be great. I know it has a lot of its challenges. Um, but I, I wouldn't trade what I've been able to experience on the mission field these past couple of years for, um, you know, for marriage right now. And I think, right. um, it's, it's something where it's like, we can kind of live in this tug of war of always wanting something we don't have, or we can accept, um, what God has given us and say like, all right, Lord, like, what do you want to, to use, um, mm -hmm. with what you've given me, um, because I'm just going to give it to you and, and let's see what you can do with it. And it's, I think it's kind of mind blowing when we start operating from a place of 
a freedom mentality versus that like I'm single, I'm like this victim mentality is kind of like pushing down on me and it's limiting me. Um, so I think there's a lot more freedom in singleness than we, we often paint it out to be. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So what would you say to those people who are, um, may not have had the experiences that you've been able to have on the mission field, um, but are feeling like if I embrace my singleness, that, that, that by necessity means that I'm embracing singleness for a lifetime. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like a lot of people can maybe feel hesitant to embrace singleness because they think it means, well, that means I'm accepting that I'll be single for forever. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but maybe you can, what, do you, what would you say to those, those people? Yeah. I think one of the things that's hard is the, the constant conversation around like, who are you dating or are you dating anybody? Like, um, oh man, are you, are you still single? I heard somebody say one time, like he, he started asking them the question back, like, oh, are you still married? <laughs> like, it's kind of like a weird, it's just kind of like a weird question to, to ask, yeah, but it's, absolutely. it's part of, it's part of our culture. And I, like I say, I fall into it. Like a lot of my conversations with, with my friends, like they all want to know, like, are you talking to anybody? And there's, again, there's that giddy aspect of like, let's just talk about this. I think what's talked about less is the opportunities that you have um, with the gift that you're given. And so something that I even just like wrote down as I was like kind of preparing for this podcast was like, Lord, help me to go to your word more than I go to my friends for conversation. Because I think a lot of our conversations are probably getting our thinking in the wrong spot. If you go to like the famous, you know, passage in scripture is 1 Corinthians 7. Um, if you kind of like walk through that chapter, you kind of get stoked about being single at the end of right. like what Paul mm -hmm. is saying. You're like, yeah. here's, a, here's a guy that we look up to so much in our faith. Um, and at this point in his life, when he's writing and, and doing all these things for the Lord, like he, he is single. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is amazing that he talks about is having the ability to like focus our mind on Christ and like give him, present to him our bodies and our spirit. Um, we're able to do so in an undivided way. And I think if you as a human being like present your undivided self to the Lord, whether you end up traveling the world, whether you end up, you know, starting some crazy business, like whatever you do, like it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, like a, a shiny thing. But I right. think there's so much opportunity when you do present your undivided self to God. Mm -hmm. And I think it can take you to some really really amazing places. Once you start seeing, oh, I actually have freedom here. I don't just have to sit on my hands and wait for God to bring the one into my right. life. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, I, I would love to get your thoughts on this, man. Like I realized that an undivided mind is so powerful in the hands of the Lord. So it like, it would make sense that the enemy would want to distract like people who are single or get us to constantly like wish we were married um, or, you know, tempt us with like sexual sins so that our minds become divided so that our effectiveness for Christ is, is lessened. And I'm like, man, right. if, if we could kind of like shed some light on that truth of saying like the enemy knows how effective you can be in the kingdom if you give your whole self to God. So it mm -hmm. makes sense that he would want to like come at single people and try to divide our, you know, whether it's divide us in our community, make us feel like we're not in the married group or in the, the part of the whole. Um, I just realized when I started thinking about it that there's a lot of division that comes after us in this day and age when we're single, maybe because the enemy does know what could happen if we present our undivided self to Christ. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an amazing thought. And, and honestly, I, I would, I would just say to those who, um, a lot of, a lot of times I think when you're single, you think like all of these, whatever, whatever the issue it is, whatever the desire, whatever the temptation you think it's going to go away when I get married. But like the thing that you're talking about right now is the potential for your mind to be divided or distracted or anything like that from giving your whole self to Christ is it still happens in marriage. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that's a battle that I still fight. Um, 
no matter no matter what it is the the particular types of temptations that the men deal with you know what i mean like more so than women um those are the battles that i still have to fight the mental battles that i have to fight on a daily basis would be it might not be the exact same issue but it would be the same mental battles um that the single person would be fighting on a daily basis as well like it doesn't change you know whether you have somebody or not um whether you're married or not you know so it's it's still that um that persistence um towards being able to have your mind fully on christ and your heart fully devoted to christ isn't going to be greater if you are married or once you get married you know what i mean you're still gonna, right it's the, it's the same battle that you're fighting um and i think you make a great point i think it's just it goes across all areas that um if we can be distracted in some capacity or another, um, then, then I think that is an objective by um, the devil to get us off course. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I can totally, totally resonate with that. Absolutely. And I like how yeah. you, how you frame that. And that's a great way that you put it too, is like, as a married couple, we as like one flesh now, we, we need to like give ourselves to Christ. And I think that's where Paul's coming from, where it's like, that's, there's, there's complications in that sometimes. Whereas your yeah. opportunity as a single individual, like simplifies that issue, whether it's Satan coming at the unity of the marriage or whether he's coming at like your identity as a single believer, like he's, he's trying to, he's trying to like, um, take down both because he knows that both can be like so effective in the kingdom. And I think something else that, um, I think about whenever it comes to, um, this thought of singleness and, and how it's looked down upon is that it's like, what are we actually elevating when we look down upon singleness? Are we, are we really like putting God in this proper place or are we, are we putting like relationships, intimacy, like sex? Like what are we actually worshiping right. when we feel like we're missing out on things because mm-hmm. we're single? Cause like according to scripture, um, according to, to Paul, like, we both have the same opportunity for intimacy with Christ, whether we're single or married. I think there's, there's this idea that it's like, man, if I can just get married and like be physically intimate, uh, physically intimate with somebody, um, then I've discovered this new side of God that like I'll mm-hmm. never have experienced before. Hey, yeah. And that's just not true. Like marriage is a beautiful picture of of relationship with Jesus. But as a single man, like I'm the bride of Christ. I, I mm-hmm. am married to Jesus, like in those, right. in, that, in that, in that term, yeah. like there is a better marriage than just like the physical one here on earth. Mm-hmm. But we just, we just elevate marriage so much. Um, right. And I think it's a good like question to ask ourselves, like, are we worshiping this or are we actually worshiping God? And are we fully stepping into our opportunity to be intimate with him? Whether you're a single person or a married person, it doesn't matter. Like we both have the yeah. same chance to be um, intimate with Jesus. It's not that there is, um, there's not like we're getting ushered beyond the veil whenever, yeah. whenever uh, you get married because that veil is torn and we all have yeah. access to, to intimacy right. with Christ. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And what we, and you referencing 1 Corinthians 7 reminded me of, because uh, I was reading that as well in preparation for this yeah. podcast also. And what blew me away is, is Paul literally said, it's not something that's prescriptive for the believer, but he, he shares his heart in that passage. And he actually says that his desire is that they would be single like him. Um, yeah. Which is amazing. Like to, to view singleness the way Paul viewed it um, yeah. would be, um, I, I don't know, would be huge for us to, to get this understanding or get this idea out of our head that singleness is a bad thing. Singleness is a bad thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I would love to see, us try to switch the culture um, and celebrate whatever gift the individual has been given. If that's mm-hmm. like a gift of being single and having opportunity to do whatever it is God called you to do, if that's the gift of marriage and you're able to reflect Christ in your relationship, um, just kind of like celebrating it and, and being excited for the possibilities of what Christ can do, as opposed to being bummed out by the social status and what it does or doesn't reflect. Um, and I think it's like, it's an honor that you like look at my life as a single guy and be like, man, he's used his single life well. 
Um, and that's why I say it's like, I still, there's, it's so often that I like desire to be married and desire a relationship. But I think like, yeah, like let's celebrate the opportunities that each of us have. And hopefully some other people can listen and be encouraged to mm-hmm. kind of be like, okay, God, like I do have my entire life as a single individual to give to you. Like, here it is. Like, what can right. you do with it? Um, Cause you might be surprised like that he wants to partner with you as a single individual because there are ways that he can partner with you that he can't partner with married individuals with families. You know, it's, it's going to be different. And so let's, uh, let's give him our lives as a single community. Let's, let's encourage our married friends. Let's be encouraged by our married friends and, and, and essentially like be the body of Christ together. Um, and, and to remember that we're these, these like things don't actually divide us. They are strengths within the body that he can use. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's incredible. Um, so we're kind, of, we're kind of inching closer to the end of our time. I wanted to read something to you and just kind of get your final thoughts on. Um, something that I, I, I listened to recently in a podcast, and I thought it was really interesting. Now, I'm going to explain this um, as best as I can, especially for the audience. So this is a man named uh, Sam Alberry. Um, I don't know if you've heard the name before, but um, Sam Alberry. I don't know if I have. Okay. He's, he's a pastor. I think he's in, in the UK, but he's actually a pastor who, um, who, str- who has struggled with uh, most of his life with uh, same sex attraction. Um, and, um, and, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to assume here that if you're single, this is the reason you're struggling. This is the reason you're single. Okay. That's, that's sure. not what I'm emphasizing here. He actually has, he actually has written a book is God anti-gay, but um, he's a believer. Mm-hmm. He's a pastor. And um this is kind of a quote from his book that I felt was very, um, very inspiring and uh, very helpful for not just a single person, but the, the married person as well. This is for all believers. So if you wouldn't mind, Connor, I'll just take a few moments and, and read this um, and just kind of get your thoughts on it. Um, so he says, okay, sounds good. He says this, um, uh, he says, it is the same for all of us, whoever. I am to deny myself, take up my cross and follow him. Every Christian is called to costly sacrifice. Denying yourself does not mean tweaking your behavior here and there. It is saying no to your deepest sense of who you are for the sake of Christ. To take up a cross is to declare your life as you have known it, forfeit. It is laying down your life for the very reason that your that your life, it turns out, is not yours at all. It belongs to Jesus. He made it, and through his death, he has bought it. This is really interesting right here. Ever since I have been open about my own experiences with homosexuality, a number of Christians have said something like this. The gospel must be harder for you than it is for me, as though I have more to give up than they do. But the fact is that the gospel demands everything out of all of us. If someone thinks the gospel, um, sorry, if someone thinks the gospel has, has somehow slotted into their life quite easily without causing any major adjustments to their lifestyle or aspirations, it is likely that they have not really started following Jesus at all. Yeah. Yeah. So I just thought that was amazing is like him going through his experience is totally different than, than most single people, obviously, but um, the sacrifice that he's talking about is the same sacrifice that all Christians are called to in embracing Christ and following Christ. So I don't know, maybe get uh, your thoughts on that quickly. Yeah, man, that's what applies to all of us. It's like the cost of following Jesus. And I think that's a great point that he makes is like, oh man, because you're, you struggle with like homosexuality um, or that's like your wrestle in the Christian environment, because that is like the number one, like taboo sin, right. In so many churches and so many like preachings and teachings it's almost as if like, oh, I'm, I'm married. I don't struggle with sexual sin. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm straight. Like, I, you know, it's like we just assume so much. And I think very little we do we actually look at the call of Christ. And if we understood that he's asking us to put it all on the altar for him. And that um, it's not like this just thing that in the middle of the road we can do. It's like, no, we, we have to come face to face with the fact that he's, he's calling all of us. He wants all, right. all of us, everything, yeah. um, all, all of our vulnerability. Like he wants to strip us of those fig leaves and he wants to, to, to have everything. And um, whether you're like, wherever you're at, 
um, in whatever stage of life, um, we have to understand that that's what Jesus is asking for. Um, and it's either a yes or no. Like, we've just created a Christianity where we can have our cake and eat it too. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, there is such grace and mercy within life with Christ. Um, but he's also asking for, for fierce follow and then dedication. Um, right. and, uh, and when we elevate certain things um, like physical intimacy or whatever it may be, um, and, and we think like, oh, because I'm okay in this area of life, I can just kind of do what I want over here. We've kind of, I think, missed an important part of Jesus' call. Yeah, absolutely. So I love that quote, man. Yeah, it's great. And for Sam, like he he views like he views a life, he's single, so he views a life of celibacy as a worthy sacrifice for the cause of Christ, which is just wow. amazing to me. And it's so inspiring. And and I would just encourage those who maybe they feel like they have a call to singleness on their life. It is a worthy, worthy cause. And I would highly um elevate their choice to do that. Um yeah for the sake of Christ. Um, and I just think that's amazing. So as we, Connor, I'm just going to kind of give you the last, last word here. Um, just an encouraging thought for those who are single, who um, are either waiting for that somebody or waiting for God's call on their life or not sure. If you just get a final, give a final encouraging word um, to those in individuals. And then after that, would you just kind of give a plug for where people can find you? Um, whatever that might be, um, then we can just link to that in the, in the description below also. Absolutely. I think my encouraging plug is the thing that I'm, I'm trying to encourage myself with is saying like, um, God, here's my obsession with the idea and expectation of being married. Like I want to give that to you and I want to like not worship this concept or not like continually think about this idea because I know that you're better like whatever it is that I'm stacking up against you whatever whatever idol whatever tendency that I have to turn away from you or to elevate something else like you are better um and I want to live my life not just knowing that in my head but actually believing that from my heart because when that happens it's going to transform the way that I live um, so for those who are single like me, like let's stop obsessing over and maybe even worshiping something that is not worthy of our obsession and our, and our worship. Um, as far as places that you would like to, uh, maybe connect with me or find me, my primary source is going to be through my blog. It is connorgall.theworldrace.org, C-O-N-N-O-R-G-A-U-L dot the world race dot org and um that's where you can find some of the things i've written and you can also um, figure out ways to connect with me from there i'm also currently fundraising so if you listen to this podcast and you want to you want to uh, donate to my my uh, life of missions um you can also donate there as well that's a little maybe shameless plug that i'm throwing in there for myself but, that's uh, that's fine uh, that's fine <laughs> <laughs> i've uh, i've made some youtube videos as well uh documenting my journey on the world race these past couple years i'm not currently making new videos but if you'd like to check out some of my journey you can look at it at uh, uh youtube <laughs> and just type in my name connor gall and you'll find me okay awesome yeah and we will link to both of those um uh links um down below in the description <laughs> Thanks, um, so pe so people can find you so yeah connor I, I really appreciate you um taking the time to discuss this topic i think it was a great discussion and hopefully encouraging um to uh to single believers out there who are listening ryan thanks so much for having me it's been a pleasure Absolutely. Again, thank you. And uh, for those listening, thanks for tuning in this week on uh, the Ryan Holmes podcast. And we just want to encourage you um, to, to share this podcast, share this episode, if you think that it's going to be helpful for a believer that you know. And, um, and that's it. So we'll sign off and we'll see you next week.